All right, so we're going to do neonatal sepsis and congenital infections. So this is all much lighter than the endocrine part of the day. You guys all know this stuff hopefully pretty well. Just hammer home some really important points for the boards. So we're going to talk about the pathogens. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the epidemiology. Uh, and then we're going to shift gears and talk about congenital infections and how they're going to present them to you on the boards. Okay. So um, we're going to divide this up into perinatally acquired infections and in utero or congenital infections. And as you know, there are bacterial causes, viral causes, fungal causes, uh, which typically cause early onset sepsis, but these may also cause late onset sepsis. And then the in utero or congenital infections are usually from transplacental transmission. So it's nice to divide this up for teaching purposes into, into causes which may be bacterial versus viral versus fungal. And then we'll define early onset versus late onset. And then it's always nice to think about how the infection was acquired because that will help you figure out the organisms and the epidemiology, whether it was, per whether it was perinatally acquired versus community acquired versus hospital acquired. Remember, however, that the clinical syndromes and the clinical presentations are gonna be similar regardless of the etiology. Okay, so let's start with bacterial neonatal sepsis. The overall incidence is one to five per 1,000 live births. Early onset is usually defined as symptom onset in the first week of life. Maternal complications are usually present, and this, is, this occurs from vertical transmission of organisms which normally colonize the genital tract. So late onset sepsis is defined as having symptom onset after the first week of life. And I like to break these up into two distinct groups of neonates. One is the perfectly healthy newborn who has no risk factors for infection, who has been discharged home and then comes back later usually with fever, versus those high risk hospitalized neonates who develop hospital associated infections. So remember, the organisms that cause sepsis in these two groups are going to be different. Okay, so the first question is a 28-week gestation infant weighing 750 grams who develops hypotension and increased respiratory distress at eight hours of life. What's the most likely pathogen causing sepsis in this baby? Is it listeria, group B strep? Strep pneumoniae, E. coli, or viridin strep? So at least you should have it narrowed down to two. From, from the two, it's a little tough to pick. Okay, you picked the wrong one. <laughs> so the right answer here is E. coli. Okay, so this is a 28-weeker, 750 grammar. So why is this E. coli? Well, the, the two choices that you, you know, thought about were group E. strep and E. coli. So there has been a dramatic decline by about 80% of group E. strep since the implementation of interpartum chemoprophylaxis. However, group E. strep is still the most common cause of early onset sepsis among late preterm babies. So 34 to 36 weeks and later, Group B strep is more common. However, E. coli is now by far more common among very low birth weight infants, less than 1,500 grams. So a preemie weighing less than 1,500 gram is much more likely to have E. coli as the cause of sepsis. Okay, other causes, you should always have listeria in your differential diagnosis the first six to eight weeks of life, and then much less common would be things like viridin strep, enterococcus, H. flu, and staph aureus. So question two is a 27-day-old, former 29-weeker who is in the NICU and develops A's and B's and is hemodynamically instable. No history of a previous infection, but the baby did get seven days of AMP and GEMP empirically at birth. Physical exam at this point is non-focal, and the baby does have a PICC line. The baby goes under, the baby undergoes a sepsis workup, 
and is placed on broad spectrum antibiotics. And you get a call about 18 hours later saying the blood culture is positive. So what's the most likely thing the blood culture is going to grow? Is it strep pyogenes, coagulative negative staph, staph aureus, E. coli, or candida? So this is a baby in the NICU, preemie, pick line. What's the most common cause of sepsis under those circumstances? Okay, very good. So the answer is B, coag negative staph. So again, the way that you should look at late onset sepsis is healthy babies who previously discharged. Those bugs are pretty much the same. Group B strep, listeria, E. coli, and you always have to think of salmonella, especially in the setting of a pet lizard or an infected household contact. However, this baby is a high-risk baby who's a preemie in the NICU, and the causes of sepsis in those babies are different. So multiple studies have shown that coag negative staph is the most common cause of late onset sepsis in hospitalized preemies, usually accounts for about at least 40%. You also have to consider gram negative such as E. coli and Klebsiella and the Enterobacteraceae, including Pseudomonas, staph aureus, is a relatively common cause. Candida causes about 12%, okay? So in this population with a PICC line and a preemie, coag negative staph is gonna be the most common. And these are all the risk factors that predispose these, that predispose these babies to late onset sepsis. So again, the signs and symptoms of sepsis are subtle and nonspecific, and there's nothing about the history that's gonna distinguish these organisms from each other. Neonatal meningitis is also very difficult to distinguish from sepsis, so we generally recommend doing a lumbar puncture whenever we prove that a baby has sepsis. However, as you've, uh, you've heard before from Dr. Rodriguez, non-infectious illnesses also have similar features. You should always think about respiratory distress, congenital heart disease, and metabolic disorders. But again, most neonatal pathogens produce similar symptoms. So let's focus in a little bit about each of these organisms. So group B strep, it's important to remember that about 15 to 40 percent of all pregnant women are going to be colonized with group B strep, and this colonization is usually in both the genital and GI tracts. The highest incidence of colonization is in African Americans and women less than 20 years of age. The lowest colonization rates are in Asians and Mexican Americans. Colonization can be constant or it can be intermittent. So just because a mom is colonized during one pregnancy doesn't mean she will be colonized in the next pregnancy. And so if you do have a group B strep colonized mom, about 50% of them will be transmitted to the baby so that the baby will also be colonized with group B strep. And of those, fortunately, 98% of them will not develop any symptoms from group B strep. However, this 2% of these babies will present with early onset sepsis. So colonization is common, and of those babies that are colonized, about 2% of them will actually develop group B strep sepsis. These are some of the obstetrical risk factors for sepsis, which you're all familiar with, preterm delivery, prolonged rupture of membranes, infection of placental tissues, Group B strep in mom's urine during pregnancy is a marker for heavy colonization and is a risk factor. Having a previous baby with group B strep disease also is an important factor because those moms have low levels of anti-group B strep antibodies. And finally, demographic risk factors being African American and young maternal age also increases the risk for early onset group B strep sepsis. So question three, of the following, which is a true statement regarding early onset GBS sepsis? Respiratory distress and nonspecific features are the most common clinical manifestations. Maternal complications are uncommon. The case fatality rate is lower than with late onset sepsis. Septic shock occurs in 75% or the mean age of onset is 72 hours, which is true.
Okay, very good. So, group B strep. So the signs of early onset, as Dr. Rodriguez said, the, the incidence of early onset sepsis has decreased significantly to about 0.3 per thousand live births. The mean age of onset with GBS is eight hours of age. There is an increased incidence of prematurity. Obstetrical complications are common. The source is the maternal genital tract. And these babies, as you see, present with nonspecific, usually respiratory signs. Only about 5 to 10 percent of them will have meningitis concurrently, and about a quarter of them will have septic shock. The mortality rate with early onset GBS is about 10 to 15 percent. Late onset, again, about 0.3 per thousand live births. They usually present at about 27 days. Maternal complications and obstetrical complications are unusual. The source of the GBS with late onset sepsis is not usually clear. It may be maternal, but is usually not. Uh, it's more often either hospital acquired or acquired in the community. And these babies, as you know, usually present with fever. They have bacteremia. Meningitis is much more common with late onset sepsis. And they can also have involvement of their bone, joint, and skin. And the mortality, rate, the mortality rate is lower than with early onset sepsis. So E. coli, the incidence is approximately one per 1,000. Uh, most cases are early onset, but they can present with late onset as well. There is a capsular antigen on E. coli, which is responsible for about 80 cases of meningitis. I don't think you need to remember that for the boards. Vertical transmission is the major route of transmission. Something you do need to remember for the boards is that babies, again, with galactosemia, as you've heard a couple of times this week, are particularly susceptible to E. coli infection. The case fatality rate is high, and sequelae in the survivors also is very high. Neonatal listeriosis acts just like group B strep. There's a classic early onset form, and and the late onset form, and the manifestations are pretty much identical to group B strep, both clinically and epidemiologically. Um, the one clue to maternal listeria, however, there is usually a maternal prodromal illness, usually abdominal pain and diarrhea. An elevated monocyte count can be found in about half the bacteremic babies. Remember, this is Listeria monocytogenes. So there's usually monocytes in the blood, but not in the spinal fluid. And uh, there is a rash described with neonatal list listeriosis, which I've never seen, uh, which is a granulomatous rash called granulomatosis infantiseptacum. And uh, on the uh, pathology, there are granulomas seen on the, the rash. The diagnosis of neonatal sepsis, usually you have to isolate the organism from the blood or spinal fluid that, that makes a definitive diagnosis. Remember that latex particle agglutinations have high rates of, of false positives, so we do not rely on latex agglutination. Hematological abnormalities often are present, but none of these are sensitive or specific enough to help you rule in or rule out neonatal sepsis. The best marker uh, that is consistent with neonatal sepsis is actually an elevated ratio of immature to total neutrophils, the so-called IT ratio. Greater than 0.2 signifies a higher likelihood of neonatal sepsis. CRPs and procalcitonin uh, generally have poor positive predictive values in septic babies. So empiric treatment, as you've already heard, amp and gent is still the standard of care. Cephalosporins should not be used empirically because um, you really want to try to avoid the development of resistance. For late onset sepsis, so the babies in the NICU, when they become septic, different regimens can be used. Most commonly, it's vancomycin plus gentamicin or vancomycin plus a third generation cephalosporin. And for late onset sepsis in the well baby who has gone home and then comes back to the, to the hospital, we usually use ampicillin plus a third generation cephalosporin in that situation. 
Listeria is treated in the same manner. Ampicillin and gentamicin is bactericidal. And once you've sterilized the blood, we stop the gentamicin. Remember that cephalosporins are not effective against listeria. Uh, and we usually treat for two to three weeks. So for gram-negative sepsis and meningitis, again, we start with amp and gent. And usually once you know that there's a gram-negative in the blood or the spinal fluid, at that point, we generally add a third-generation cephalosporin, such as cephotaxime. Remember that it takes several days to sterilize the spinal fluid from gram-negatives. Uh, and we like to treat these babies for at least 14 days or, um, or 21 days. Four it's, it's usually 14 days after sterilization of the spinal fluid or 21 days, whichever is longer. Remember this for the boards. Anytime you have a gram negative in the spinal fluid that you cannot clear, you have to worry about the complication of brain abscess, which is especially common in neonates. There are three bugs that are notorious for causing this, but the one they're likely to ask you about is Citrobacter. So Citrobacter, usually it, it, uh, it was formerly called Citrobacter diversus. Now with Citrobacter coceri is a favorite of board exams. When you see that, it's a brain abscess and you want to get a CAT scan to rule out a brain abscess. All right, so prevention of early onset GBS says, you know, we use intrapartum prophylaxis, which are based on CDC guidelines. And it's important to recognize that the actual incidence of early onset group B strep sepsis has decreased significantly since the use of intrapartum prophylaxis, whereas the incidence of late onset group B strep has not changed. So treating mom with antibiotic when she is colonized decreases the risk of early onset sepsis. Late onset sepsis, because mom is not usually the one carrying the group B strep, has no effect on late onset group B strep. So we screen all moms uh, for group B strep at 35 to 37 week gestation, and we uh, offer intrapartum prophylaxis for any mom who, has, who is GBS positive, any mom who is known to be, co uh, whose, whose colonization rate is unknown and, uh, and delivers the baby at less than 37 weeks or has other risk factors for sepsis. Certainly having a previous baby with group B strep, the moms need to be prophylaxed, and group B strep in mom's urine during the current pregnancy also need prophylaxis. We generally use uh, penicillin or ampicillin for group B strep prophylaxis, and the recommendation is for cefazolin uh, if mom is penicillin allergic. Remember that GBS prophylaxis is not indicated for a mom who's, 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 who was colonized during a previous pregnancy but is not currently colonized. Group B strep back to, your, back to Ruria during a previous pregnancy also, you do not need to prophylax her. If mom has negative vaginal and rectal GBS screening tests during the current pregnancy, you do not need to prophylax her regardless of intrapartum risk factors. And then finally, a, a C-section delivery before labor on a, on a mom with intact membranes does not need to be prophylaxed. So even though we're not the ones usually doing the prophylaxis, it's usually the obstetricians, the board will expect us to know these factors. All right, so we're going to jump to viral causes. So of the following, the virus least likely to cause symptoms at birth that mimic bacterial neonatal sepsis is HSV, HIV, CMV, enterovirus, or adenovirus. Least likely to mimic bacterial sepsis. Okay, very good. So the right answer is HIV. So we're not going to talk about HIV. We're going to talk about HSV, a little bit about enterovirus, a uh, little bit about CMV and the respiratory viruses. So neonatal herpes, very important in infection. Uh, most transmission occurs at the time of delivery from an infected maternal genital tract. The babies are usually symptomatic by four to five weeks of age. And the risk that the baby uh, becomes in, in, 
infected is, is uh, highly dependent upon maternal antibody status. If mom is having a primary genital infection during, you know, at, at the time of delivery, there's a 50% chance that she will transmit the virus to the baby. If she is having a recurrence of, of genital herpes, the risk to the baby is much lower, about 5%. Unfortunately, we don't often know this because most moms are not symptomatic, even with a primary infection. So you need to remember that there's high prevalence of asymptomatic maternal infection, and therefore most babies born who has neonatal herpes are born to asymptomatic moms who have no past history of genital HSV. So a negative maternal history, either in real life or on the boards, should never make you feel better that the baby does not have neonatal herpes. Most, baby, most moms are not symptomatic, and therefore most babies will not have a history of having a mom with symptoms. There are three types of neonatal herpes infection. One that is confined to the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes, that is the most common presentation but these babies can present with disseminated infection or CNS infection. So, so fortunately, skin, eyes, or mouth is the most common presentation. These babies usually present with vesicular lesions between one and two weeks of age. It's most common to see the vesicle at the scalp electrode site because the virus gets introduced in that manner. Conjunctivitis may or may not be present. The good news is that if you pick these babies up at this stage and you treat them with a cyclovir, all of them will survive and most of them will escape morbidity. About 5% of them will actually have long-term neurodevelopmental problems for reasons that aren't totally clear. And if you don't pick them up at this stage and don't treat them with IV acyclovir, about 75% will progress to the, to the disseminated form or the CNS form. So this is a baby with neonatal herpes. As you can see, these are vesicular lesions which can be in crops on a red base. So anytime you see a fluid-filled vesicular lesion on a red base in a baby, that is herpes until proven otherwise. These are other examples of what these lesions look like. Note the red base and the vesicular lesions. The disseminated form of the disease usually presents between 5 to 12 days of age. Unfortunately, these babies may not have skin lesions, so if you don't think about herpes, you will miss it. Uh, and these babies usually present for all the world like bacterial sepsis. They may have DIC, pneumonitis, hepatitis, about two-thirds have CNS involvement and seizures. Disseminated form, these, these babies do very, very poorly. Even with treatment, the mortality rate's about 30%. The encephalitis form presents usually a little later, between two and three weeks of age. Again, a lot of them do not have skin lesions right at uh, the time of presentation. And these babies usually present with seizures, with or without fever. They're lethargic, irritable, they have poor feeding. So the diagnosis of neonatal herpes is difficult when there are no vesicular lesions, so you have to have a high index of suspicion. So the first month of life, any septic baby, you should certainly consider and probably treat with a cyclovir until you know the baby does not have neonatal herpes. We make the diagnosis by viral cultures. Certainly if there are lesions, you want to culture the lesions. Uh, this, this specific virus grows very readily in the lab. You can also do surface cultures from the nasopharynx conjunctiva, which will help increase the yield, as well as from the spinal fluid. You can do a rapid DFA stain, direct fluorescent antibody from a vesicular lesion, uh, and the, the diagnostic test of choice from the spinal fluid is a PCR test because the, the culture is only about 50% sensitive from the spinal fluid. The treatment is intravenous acyclovir, 20 per kilo per dose every eight hours, uh, and you want to monitor for neutropenia and nephrotoxicity because acyclovir crystallizes in the renal tubules if the baby is dehydrated. We treat 21 days for disseminated and CNS disease and 14 days for the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes.
I won't go over this in detail, the mortality and morbidity from disseminated and CNS disease is significant even with treatment, but the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes, if you pick up the infection and treat the baby for 14 days, all of them will survive. So going on to enteroviral infections, both the echo viruses and Coxsackie B are well known to cause severe neonatal infections. Fortunately, only about 20% of these are severe and life-threatening, even though these are fairly common. These babies, again, usually present in a nonspecific manner and very difficult to distinguish from bacterial sepsis and herpes simplex. These are clues that there may be an enteroviral infection, which they would have to give you on the boards if they want you to distinguish this from herpes or bacterial sepsis. So certainly macular or maculopapular rash, hepatitis, hepatic necrosis, myocarditis, and meningoencephalitis. They will usually give you a maternal history of abdominal pain or diarrhea sometime during the third trimester, and they usually give you the season of the year as well, because they, they want to point you in the direction of enterovirus. You make the diagnosis uh, by isolating the virus, usually from the nasopharynx or the stool. All right, so now we're, we're going to move ahead to in utero infections and try to separate some of these out for you so that you can answer questions appropriately on the board. So the manifestations here are usually going to be present right at birth, uh, and they're usually congenital defects. So it's going to be clear that this is a congenital infection, that this was not acquired at the time of delivery. So these are some of the specific features uh, that can be seen in any of the congenital infections, certainly SGA, microcephaly, calcifications, skin findings, chorioretinitis, heart, heart lesions, hepatosplenomegaly, bony lesions. These are all very nonspecific, okay? So in order to test you on these, there's going to have to be specific things about each of these infections that you're going to have to know. So we'll, that's what we're going to focus on. So let's start with CMV, which is a true statement about congenital CMV. Chorioretinitis is the most common manifestation. 1% of all babies born have CMV. Fetal infection occurs only after a primary maternal infection. Infants with asymptomatic infection have no risk of long-term sequelae, or symptomatic infection occurs in 90% of affected infants, which is true. There's a lot of material here, but if, but if you know these five facts and why they're true or not true, you know a lot about CMV. Okay, so the right answer is B. 1% of all babies born have congenital CMV. This is hard to believe, but this is by far the most common congenital infection. Fortunately, most of those babies are not symptomatic. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about CMV. By far the most common, 1%. And this is because the virus can be transmitted from both moms who have been infected with CMV before, as well as moms who are having a primary infection, although severe damage occurs almost exclusively with primary infection. The infection can also uh, occur prenatally, natally, or postnatally through breastfeeding. Again, fortunately, most babies are asymptomatic. About 90% of those 1% of babies who have CMV are asymptomatic. When they are symptomatic, these are the most common manifestations. And as you can see, skin findings, thrombocytopenia, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, calcifications in about half the babies. Chorioretinitis only occurs in about 10% of infected babies, and seizures also less common. These are some of the laboratory findings. Certainly a hepatitis, thrombocytopenia is very common. A conjugated hyperbilly, hemolysis, and increased CSF protein all are common. This is the chorioretinitis. It's usually a focal retinitis that can be very difficult to distinguish clinically from toxo. And these are the calcifications that you will see. They're going to be periventricular calcifications. So if you hear periventricular calcifications in a congenital infection, that's going to be CMV. Okay, there's nothing else that that's going to be.
So symptomatic babies, about 30% of them will die right at birth. Uh, about 60% uh, will go on to have neurodevelopmental problems as well as hearing loss. Of the babies that are asymptomatic, we'd like to think that they are home free and that we don't have to worry about them, but unfortunately, between 5 to 10% of babies who are born who are infected but who are not symptomatic will go on to have hearing loss and neurodevelopmental problems. So this is a huge, huge public health problem in this country. So a baby is found to have microcephaly, intracranial calcifications, chorioretinitis, and thrombocytopenia. You suspect congenital CMV. How are you going to make the diagnosis? CMV culture from the blood, CMV PCR from the urine, CMV culture from the urine, CMV IgG and IgM on the, on the infant, or CMV IgG and IgM on mom. What's the best way to make the diagnosis? <clears throat> okay, very, uh, no, not very good. So it's CMV culture of the urine, okay? So there's no reason to do PCR on the urine for congenital CMV. The virus grows very readily from the urine or the saliva, and a definitive diagnosis can be made if you can isolate the virus from the urine. Serology uh, is not recommended on either mom or the baby because of the high rate of false positive and false negative. You can do a PCR test from a dried blood sample, however, this is associated with low sensitivity. Question seven, a newborn baby has microcephaly as SGA and has a blueberry muffin rash and bilateral cataracts. What's the most likely congenital heart lesion associated with this infection? Is it a PDA, ASD, TGA, tricuspid atresia, or a coarc? So I know you heard this yesterday. So first you have to figure out what infection the baby has, which is rubella. This is congenital rubella, and so a PDA, is most common, pulmonic stenosis is the next most common. So unlike CMV, congenital rubella happens exclusively when mom is having a primary infection. So once moms are protected against rubella, they can never have a baby with congenital rubella. The overall risk to the baby is about 20%, but about 70% of mom gets infected in the first trimester. This is very rare in this, in this country today. Most cases are imported from Asia and Europe. Um, if a mom is inadvertently, if, uh, if a pregnant mom is inadvertently vaccinated with MMR during pregnancy, even though this is a live vaccine, you can provide reassurance because there has not been any babies born with congenital rubella syndrome following MMR vaccination. And the CDC keeps track of all these babies. They actually have a registry of some 300 and some babies that they followed. None of those babies have turned out to have congenital rubella syndrome. So if that happens, you can offer uh, reassurance to the pregnant mom. These are the manifestations of congenital rubella. Again, most babies are not symptomatic at birth. The unique aspects of rubella that you need to remember are cataracts, the blueberry muffin spots, which are sites of dermal erythropoiesis, congenital heart disease, again, a PDA and pulmonic stenosis. The retinopathy, unlike CMV, tends to be more salt and pepper in nature, and I'll show you a picture of that. IUGR postnatal growth restriction are fairly common, and then hepatosplenum megaly jaundice, those are nonspecific. So this is the so-called blueberry muffin baby. Remember, these are sites of dermal erythropoiesis, cataracts, and this is the salt and pepper retinitis that we see with rubella. So rubella and congenital syphilis, it's a salt and pepper pattern, CMV, and toxo, it's a focal chorioretinitis. Okay, so remember that. Speaking of toxo, which is true regarding congenital toxo infection? The incidence is constant despite geographic location. Prenatal diagnosis is not possible. Treatment of infected pregnant women is not recommended. 
Neurologic and visual problems become apparent in the majority of infected asymptomatic babies or fetal infection can occur following primary or reactivation of infection in mom, which is true. Okay. So, so the right answer is D. So neurologic and visual problems become apparent even in asymptomatic babies. Now it may be months later, it may be years later, but eventually those babies will, will have problems, okay? So congenital toxo, usually from exposure to oocytes during pregnancy, either from, from exposure to cats or raw beef or lamb are the major sources. Um, Again, like rubella and unlike CMV, fetal infection occurs only with a primary infection. So once moms are, have developed antibodies against toxo, they cannot transmit the infection to their babies. The incidence depends a lot on, on geographic location. In France, where steak tartare is a delicacy, the incidence of congenital toxo is much higher, and actually they screen all pregnant moms for toxo IgG at the beginning of pregnancy, whereas in this country it's relatively rare and we do not routinely screen. These are the, the overall rate of infection increases with gestational age, how, however disease severity decreases with gestational age. About 80% of babies born with congenital toxo, even if they're asymptomatic at birth, will develop eye or neurologic disease by the time they are adults, and it's usually chorioretinitis, which reactivates later in life. So remember the classic triad. So chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and cerebral calcifications, that triad is gonna to distinguish toxo from all the uh, other congenital infections. And they will present to you that triad, okay? So remember, hydrocephalus we usually don't see with the other congenital infections. So if you just remember that, you'll know it's toxo. The cerebral calcifications are, are parenchymal rather than periventricular, so that distinguishes this from CMV. And the chorioretinitis is focal, and it can be recurrent and progressive and can reactivate years later. So this is the necrotizing chorioretinitis of congenital toxo. We do like to make a prenatal diagnosis when, when we can. We do this by finding toxo DNA in the amniotic fluid. There's also isolation techniques uh, through tissue culture and you can also do serial fetal ultrasounds looking for increased sizes of the lateral ventricles. Postnatally, it's not an easy diagnosis, but we do uh, utilize PCR from the amniotic fluid or the fetal blood. Histopathology can also be helpful, as well as trying to culture toxo. Serology is problematic because a lot of times you can't distinguish maternal infection from infant infection. Um, treating moms who are known to be infected dur during pregnancy, you can treat them with spiromycin to decrease transmission from the mom to the baby. Once the baby, once the fetus is in infected, we, we would have to use pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine to decrease the severity of infection. If a baby is born with congenital toxo, we know that treatment decreases the severity of disease and the frequency of sequelae, and those babies are treated with pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine, usually for the whole first year of life. These are the parenchymal calcifications, and as you can see, this baby has a VP shunt, meaning the baby has hydrocephalus and parenchymal calcifications. So just from looking at this alone, you know this is congenital toxo. Same thing. All right, I think this is the next to the last question. We're winding down, six minutes to go here. 
One week old baby develops a copious bloody nasal discharge, lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, and hemolytic anemia, which is the, which is the most likely additional feature in this infant. Hydrocephalus, periostitis, limb hypoplasia, seizures, or high drops. So again, it's not enough to know what infection this is, but you also have to know the complications and the other findings with the infection. So what is this? What is the, what is the infection here? Congenital syphilis, okay. So once you've figured out this is congenital syphilis, which of these is most likely? Well, Okay, very good. So the right answer is B, periostitis. So bony lesions are very common with congenital syphilis, much more common than the other findings here. So a few words about congenital syphilis, about 30 to 40 percent of fetuses are stillborn, and of those who make it to be live-born, about 70 percent of them are asymptomatic at birth and are only identified through prenatal maternal screening. So because the fetus acquires the infection via the hematogenous route, you should remember that all the manifestations of congenital syphilis are just like secondary syphilis, okay? Because this is acquired hematogenously. So unique features, generalized lymphadenopathy is much more common than with the other congenital infections. They usually have a Coombs negative hemolytic anemia. Snuffles is very specific for congenital syphilis. So any baby with a bloody rhinitis, which is called snuffles, that's congenital syphilis. And rashes are very common because secondary syphilis rashes are very common. The maculopapular rash with scaling and desquamation is most common, but there's also a vesicle bullous rash that can be seen called pemphigus syphilyticus with congenital syphilis. Bony lesions are very common and may be the most frequently encountered manifestations. CNS manifest manifestations also are common. And again, the chorioretinitis is salt and pepper distribution like with rubella. These are some of the bony lesions. They don't show up real, real, real well here. They can have a periostitis. They can have an osteomyelitis also. Uh, these are really, really common. This is a baby with congenital syphilis. There's a there's a uh, vesicle bullous rash. This baby has snuffles. You can't see it real well. This baby, you, you can definitely see this, the bloody mucousy nasal discharge, massive hepatosplenomegaly as well. I'm not going to go over this. This is the workup of babies with, who are suspected of having congenital syphilis. This is right from the Red Book. Uh, certainly you pick these babies up by knowing mom's maternal status during pregnancy. Any mom who has a positive RPR, it needs to be confirmed with a treponemal test. And then if mom has both a positive RPR and a positive treponemal test, those babies need to be worked up for congenital syphilis unless you can prove that the, that the moms have been treated appropriately and that their RPR titers have become negative, which rarely happens in real life. So in real life, we generally end up working up all those babies and treating them. This is the workup of babies who are suspected of having congenital syphilis. And once you suspect or prove that a baby has congenital syphilis, the treatment options are real simple. It's either uh, penicillin G IV for 10 days, and in very rare instances when you can assure follow-up uh, one dose of benzathine, penicillin G IM may be okay, but, but is generally not. So most experts recommend treating with IV pen G for at least 10 days unless you can really be absolutely sure that the babies can be followed through the first year of life and you know that they don't have CNS infection. But for your purposes, IV pen G for 10 days is the treatment. All right, last question. Which congenital infection is associated with high drops? Varicella, HIV, HHV6, parvovirus, or Borrelia? 
Okay, very good. This is parvo. This is a hydropic baby. Uh, and the most common cause of congenital infection causing this is parvovirus B19. Fortunately, at least at least 50% of uh, pregnant moms have become seropositive prior to pregnancy, so the likelihood that they will transmit the infection to their baby is low. Uh, it's estimated that the overall risk of fetal loss if a mom is infected during pregnancy is about one to two percent. These are some of the consequences of maternal parvovirus infection. Most babies are born live and are completely asymptomatic and do not have any problems later, but certainly IUGR, high drops, stillbirths, and isolated pleural and pericardial effusions have all been documented. All right, five seconds to spare. How do you like that? All right. Thank you.